Welcome to the Travis Masterbone Podcast. I am your host, Travis Masterbone, talking some shit to impact your life. This is episode 15, titled Chocolate and the History of Money. So, this might be my most exhilarating podcast episode yet. Please, oh please, try to pay attention, grab a notepad or a pillow, whatever is clever. But overall, the purpose of this episode, much like many, is to educate people. And this will be specifically on, obviously, money. And yes, there will be some chocolate education as well, but we will intertwine them. This is basically coming from the book, His- uh, The History of Money, written by Jack Weatherford. It is really an interesting and probably one of the most accurate books on the on history in general, and more specifically, money. We're going to be talking about classic cash, the beginnings, the origins of money. Uh, In the book, he goes a little bit deeper into paper cash and into the electronic cash era. And so it's a very, very interesting book. I highly recommend it. And so I just wanted to do an episode summarizing his beginning chapters, uh, beginning chapters under classic cash. And we're going to specifically be revolving around the ancient Aztecs and, of course, chocolate, more specifically cacao beans as their commodity of money for their dominating empire. I will make a later uh, episode that dives a bit deeper on gold, silver, and precious metals, but today we are going to be focusing on commodity money. And so, overall, the evolution of money, I think understanding it, going back to the origins, and really trying to dive in to as much detail as possible in learning about how it how it evolved and how it has played a role in different societies around the world and what commodity money um, was used at the time and how the systems over time developed and changed for the better from a primitive to more advanced and so I think starting from the very beginning working with it the nuts and bolts you get a really better idea of how to use money today in my opinion and once again this is the whole purpose i am going to do my best i am always just trying to summarize and be brief and uh, i always encourage you to do a little bit more diving yourself so he starts off specifically with the ancient aztecs who are the ancient aztecs they were the native american people who dominated northern mexico at the time of the Spanish conquest. In the early 16th century, they settled on several small islands, and in 1325, they founded the town of Tenochtitlan. I probably butchered that. But today, it is modern-day Mexico City. So pull up a map, look up Mexico City. There's northern Mexico. The ancient Aztecs dominated all of that. Then, to be more specific, they dominated about four to 500 city-states and in in about... 5 million plus people. And so they did not directly govern these city-states. They established what we call a tribute system. Okay. And so in order to maintain some level of independence, they uh, subjugated people around them, all those um, neighboring city-states and people. They subjugated them having them pay taxes and in labor, of course, and sacrificial victims. No big deal. But within this um, tribute system, you know, the local markets played a minor role. But believe it or not, cacao beans played a major role. And so of all forms of Aztec money, there is more, but we'll get into that in a bit. Chocolate proved to be the most commonly available and easiest to use. And so, cacao beans, the words that I mentioned earlier, commodity money, cacao beans operated as that. And so, I guess we can get down to the basics. Hopefully, we all know what money is. We chase it every day. And uh, in one way, shape, or form, it is used pretty much with everything that's around us. This computer, microphone, the book itself that I'm reading, these clothes around me and on me, um, money is our current medium, a current medium of exchange, and we use it in the form of coins and banknotes right now. And it's fiat currency 
since we went off the gold standard in 1971. And hopefully that doesn't sound like too much gibberish when we say fiat currency. It essentially just means it's backed by nothing. We used to use these banknotes or these notes as um, you know, paper that represented gold inside of a bank. But then we got rid of that. So I can get a little bit more detailed about that in a different episode. But overall, what is a commodity? A commodity is a raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought and sold. And this could be anything from copper to coffee. And in this circumstance, chocolate, a.k.a. cacao beans. And so what is commodity money? So we just use the commodity as money, right? It's money whose value comes from a commodity of which it is made consists of objects having value or use in themselves, which is what we call intrinsic value, as well as their value in buying goods. OK, so just keep that in mind. And when we talk about this medium of exchange, all a medium of exchange is is some middleman instrument or a system. And it's used to facilitate the purchase and sale of goods and services between parties. OK, and so for a system to function as a medium of exchange, it must represent a standard of value. All parties to the transaction must accept that standard. And we are going to get into that with these beans. OK, and so it's interesting, you know, these beans, they get brought to their city market. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the damn name, but you could buy anything with these beans. This was their money um, to, to an extent. Fruits, veggies such as corn, tomatoes, squash, peanuts, many more, meats, fish, venison, duck, jewelry, gold, silver, jade, manufactured goods such as sandals, clothing, feathered capes, cotton padded armor, um, weapons, pottery, and baskets. They also use these beans, obviously in bigger bulk, which we'll get into in a second, for slaves and also alcohol. Yes, they had alcohol. And so commodity money, their cacao beans, it was more based off barter. Okay, and so barter is the exchange, um, your goods or services for other goods and services. There's no medium of exchange between it, like handing over a dollar to pay for something, right? And he uses a, an ancient Aztec example, and he uses an iguana. Some guy is trying to trade an iguana for a load of firewood from another party. So if the goods did not have the same exact value, however the fuck they figured that out, the traders would even out the value in, you guessed it, chocolate. So say the iguana was worth five cacao beans, but the firewood was worth six. The gentleman selling or trying to trade, I would say, um, the iguana, he would just add one cacao bean to it, and there you go. That's an even trade if the other party accepts that. Okay? And so with that being said, uh, Jack Weatherford, the author of this book, creeps a bit more towards the main premise and, in my opinion, the main takeaway of this entire chapter and what I mentioned with the slaves is large purchases. You know, that's a lot of beans. Beans would go as high as 24,000 cacao beans. So that's a lot. And so these quantities become too cumbersome. And we'll see this as well when it comes to gold and then moving into the banknotes, right? The paper money. And so it was too cumbersome for these bigger and even daily transactions. You don't want to be hauling around bags of beans all over the place, right? And so primitive systems that focused their commerce on certain important commodities. In these, in these circumstances, it makes sense that they had multiple commodities to standardize the exchanges. So as I mentioned earlier, cacao beans weren't the only uh, commodity monies for the ancient Aztecs. So to avoid this hauling around bags of beans for bigger purchases, the Aztecs had a backup and they used actually cotton cloaks, which varied in value from 60 to 300 cacao beans. And so 
These were obviously used for those bigger financial purchases, such as slaves and sacrificial victims moving forward. But this all makes sense, right? And they used other commodities as well, such as beads, shells, and copper bells, right? So it's very fascinating how they used all these commodities within their system so everyone could get what they wanted. Um, so there are some advantages, right, being an item of consumption as well as a means of exchange, right? Because the beans you could actually grind in the chocolate paste and then you can vigorously um, grind them into a container or, yeah, grind them into a container of water to make a delicious drink that they also valued. You know, paper money and cheap coins, they obviously couldn't do this. So in that sense, commodity money had its value in itself. And uh, chocolate, like all other types of you know, money, it really doesn't have any inherent value outside of of a cultural context. So in order for it to have value, people have to want it, but they have to know how to use it. They don't know how to turn it into chocolate paste or they don't know what it is, then it's not valuable to them. And the funny example that he mentions here, if you sail far east, the pirates of Europe, apparently this was a common thing, if they seized a ship that was loaded with these beans, they would mis they would mistake the beans for rabbit shit, right? And they would dump the entire cargo into the sea because they had no idea of its value. So this is a prime example. They could have easily made their way west to the Mesoamerican lands of northern Mexico. And they could have uh, made a killing and traded it for a lot more useful items. But they didn't know. So that's a prime example of how we could look at value and this uh, commodity system, right? So there was plenty of benefits, but... We also are aware that there are some complications and issues that needed to be resolved. And this occurred to in economies all, all throughout the world. As they started to develop and expand further through time, we see the advancement, which I will get into in later episodes. But it is really interesting how um, so many different societies and cultures, they used different commodities from salt to tobacco, um, from logs to dried fish, the beans, cloth, you know, it's all over the place. And so it's really fascinating to me. And so uh, this is going to be one of my shorter episodes. I just wanted to kind of round out and go into uh, some of the fun facts about certain commodities, salt. So in China, North America, and the Mediterranean, salt was the commodity money predominantly at the time and in that same era and so not the best for traders that were traveling and living in hot areas so they would mine large slabs of salt as long as three feet and several inches thick and they wrapped it up in certain uh, cotton to kind of protect it and make sure none of it chips off but salt was such a great uh, commodity money at the time because it could easily be cut and st into standardized sizes right for small exchanges or bigger slabs for bigger exchanges and so interesting fun fact would be the modern english word salary and also the italian spanish and portuguese word salario derived from the latin word sal go figure and more precisely salarius meaning of salt so that's pretty interesting right there and so it was thought of also that the roman soldiers were paid in salt and when they received money for that purpose they would use um, when they received money the purpose of buying salt was just to flavor bland food so it was useful in both senses right the big benefit of the commodity money but then also a fun fact cattle Right, So more pastor pastoral people throughout history, they use various types of animals as this type of money, this commodity. So like reindeer, buffalo, sheep, oxen, wherever people had cattle, they tended to use as commodity money. And so pastoralists paid virtually everything. And I'm going to quote uh, Mr. Weatherford again. Um, they paid for everything from slaves and wives to fine for adultery and even murder in cows, end quote. Uh, pretty funny. But the traditional importance of cattle survives indirectly in several 
modern European languages. For example, pecus means cattle, and pecuniary means related to money. And this derives from the Latin word pecuniarius, which also means wealth in cattle. And so the related English words pecunious means wealthy, and to call someone impecunious is to call them poor, or means poor, right? So the word cattle derived from the same Latin roots that also gave us capital. And then we all know of chattel, which means any item of movable personal property, uh, such as a slave, is also derived from the same source. So it is interesting that um, modern names for two of the most important economic systems in European history, capitalism and feudalism, can both be traced back to these systems based on cattle as their commodity money. And so there's also definitely times when even humans were being served as a measure of money throughout history as well. So overall, this is going to be a short and sweet episode. Fascinating stuff from my opinion. Um, this translates easily, um, transitions easily into gold, silver, and precious metals. But I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that and make a longer episode and introduce you to my man, Peter Schiff. That will be my next episode that I will get into next week. Um, but overall, I hope you enjoyed this and did not fall asleep too quickly. Instead, took notes. Again, the book is called The History of Money by Jack Weatherford. Highly recommend it. Go get it. Um, and please, as always, thank you for listening to the Travis Masterbone podcast. Like, share, subscribe, all that shit. And I look forward to you tuning in next time. Farewell.